former White House press secretary under Bush 43. Ari Fleischer is here with us in the studio. Good to see you, sir. And um, this whole idea, that's the way the president kind of operates. He's obviously trying to put pressure on the Congress. So I wonder if it'll work. It's the way outsiders operate. It's the way a lot of business people operate. If you don't have that hard deadline, that realistic uh, drop dead event. Mm -hmm. Politicians will take their time to do anything. Yeah, they work up to 11:59:59. We see it all the time. And if there's no 11:59, they never stop working. Right. So <laughs> if there is no deadline for when NAFTA goes away, for if you don't want to extend the NAFTA when the new way the president's proposed, you just let the status quo continue forever. Well, comes the outsider and says, I don't do it that way. Yeah. That's how I view what he's doing here, and I, I think he's probably right. He probably is. The risk, obviously, is that financial markets, which are in a, a good mood, for a lack of a better term, today after the China news, or at least this truce that seems to have been put in place over the weekend, they get a little bit jittery with, with uncertainty, whereas you may, maybe you're putting pressure on the Democrats in Congress, but the, the markets want to say, all right, I thought this whole NAFTA thing was rear view mirror stuff. You maybe know, it's I, not. I try to be fair to President Trump to study what he does and to say why, mm -hmm. and to look at him the way he was elected to be, somebody that changed Washington. The press doesn't like all these changes. The Washington politicians don't like all the changes. Markets don't like all the changes. They all prefer stability. Right. Along comes the outsider, the bull in the china shop who brings a china shop with him everywhere he goes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the most effective way to change Washington. You have to do that. Otherwise, you submit to the status quo yourself. Right. We'll see. But this is Trump's operations, and I can't fault him for it. Now, what, what do you make of what he did this weekend in Buenos Aires, how he handled the, uh, the Chinese? He doesn't have a deal yet. Nobody's saying that he does. But he d has bought himself some time for negotiation. And again, the market, for today at least, for now, likes that. What do you make of the way he's handled that? Yeah, I thought it was the exact same thing. No other person in politics would go in with all these tariffs, risk the trade war to try to accomplish a bigger goal. Every politician would be spooked. Right. Trump doesn't get spooked. Do you think he's spooked a little bit by the markets having no. gone down? I, well, yeah, I think that, that... And did that kind of inform? the way he handled this weekend's negotiations? I think when you look at Donald Trump's decades-long history about trade with Asia, Japan, or China, yeah. no, he doesn't get spooked. He wants to win the fight. As a politician now, I think he preferred to have calm in the markets going up. Mm -hmm. But I think this was about his relationship with President Xi. I think he has that personal rapport, and he said, I'll declare a truce because my relationship with Xi is so good, and then we'll come back and see. How That's much do those temporarily to the good? Those personal relationships. I mean, obviously you can say a lot, but that, I'm sure you saw it in working with President Bush a little bit. Those personal one-on-one -on -one relationships matter because we get caught up. We'll talk about this in a minute when we get into China in our next segment. But we get caught up. Is Robert Lighthizer leading the negotiations? Is Peter Navarro involved? Is Secretary Mnuchin involved? But what about the one-on-one leader-to-leader -on -one -leader relationships? That's all part of the mix. You have your advisors over your shoulders giving you the views, but ultimately it comes down to the decider in chief, the president. And when he is another decider in chief, the president of China, saying to him, I'll give you X, Y, and Z if you give me A, B, and C, yeah. even if it's not in writing, even if it's subject to negotiation in 90 days out, that is powerful. Now, over those 90 days, if it doesn't come to be, then of course we're going to be right back where we started. This is how it works. And this president might be likely, more likely than others, I think, to kind of cut one of those deals, maybe without checking with advisors sometimes. Absolutely. You know, which is funny. Um, I want to give you time to reflect on, on the death yeah. of President Bush as the country remembers uh, Bush 41 today. What are you thinking about? You know, I, I just remember, and I'm pretty sure it was after September 11th, President George H.W. Bush came around the White House in the West Wing, and he just poked his head into everybody's offices. And he came into mine, and just to give me an attaboy, he said, you guys are doing great, you're doing a wonderful job for your country, keep it up. Yeah. You know, how nice was that? And it fits so much with what we've been hearing, and what we know about this president's benevolence and kindness. I thought that was in... Um when President Bush, uh, W. Bush, uh, was interviewed by 60 Minutes last night, and he, uh, Nora O'Donnell asked him about that, and he cut him off right uh, before even the question was finished. Um, you know, what advice did he give? And he says, he said, I love you. Yeah. You know, he didn't, it wasn't about necessarily the policy advice all the time for it, even when his son was president. Did you notice that? Oh, uh, absolutely. It wasn't about, hey, do this, that, or the other thing, but he was just there. Vis a vis George W. Bush, I was asked it all the time when I was his press secretary, and since then, I've been with President Bush on numerous occasions since he left office and people ask him what did your father advise yeah. you oh, I always said he gave me unconditional love he didn't give me advice on right. tactics and handle this or that it was love but the funny part about that was he said not that many people saying things like that to you when you're president <laughs> you get an attack from all angles <laughs> That's right. so it's a unique and we've only had it twice in our history but having a father-son uh, presidency was was unique I guess right mm. and two close people yeah. They, they really care for each other. Uh, the other little tidbit here, though, is George W. Bush always used to say, don't forget, 
I've got half my mother in me too. <laughs> Who was he? Boy, he was more like his mother. He was more like his mother. He was right. He Personality was, wise, he was the towel snapper, the quick re, re, retort. Um, but he had the grace and the dignity of his father, and the quick wit. Yeah. Uh, and the willingness to mix it up and fight a little like his mother. And I noticed in one of his father's interviews years ago that uh, I was rereading it this weekend that he gave both of his sons credit for being more astute politically in terms of connecting with people, both Jeb and George W., uh, than he was. No, so. no question. I think that's true. And one of the things I have to point this out, yep. all the wonderful coverage of George H. W. Bush now, many who are praising him now are the ones who use these very same issues to criticize him when he was president. Yep. Now he's, he's he was, back then he was patrician, out of touch, they used to say when he was in office. And now they're using this as noblesse oblige, a role model, well, self-service to the country. The news we cover when he was uh, portrayed as a, as a wimp. That's right. right. That's right. I'm glad they're getting it right now, but I wish they got it right back then too. Good to see you today, uh, especially today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Ari Fleischer. Now,